Blessed Palm Sunday to everyone on this uh, March 28th, last Sunday of the uh, month of March. Uh, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, April 4th, and uh, Carlene and I are so looking forward to seeing everybody at the town hall uh, on that Sunday at 1030 for our Easter service. It will truly be a resurrection for uh, each and every one of us as well as our whole parish family. Uh, social distancing and masks will still be uh, required but it will be great for all of us to be together on Easter. And uh, on that Sunday as well, following that Easter Sunday service, we'll be doing uh, Joe Roeder's uh, graveside service in our memorial garden at uh, the church uh, for all of those of you who would like to uh, come and attend that. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that as well. And it seems like a fitting day to um, bury Joe in our memorial garden. Uh, because it is the feast of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection to which all of us are called uh, because of his rising from the tomb on Easter Sunday. We're going to begin this morning, page 351, which is the penitential order, uh, as we have been doing through throughout this Lenten season. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Keep each and every one of you in eternal life. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading on this Palm Sunday is taken from the prophet Isaiah, the 50th chapter, beginning at the fourth verse. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. 
Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. He who, who will contend with me, let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord who helps me, who will declare me guilty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm appointed for today is Psalm number 31, verses 9 through 16, and that's page 623, uh, if you happen to have your prayer books or your inserts uh, with you this morning. The refrain is, Have mercy on me, O Lord. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. For my life is wasted with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I have become a reproach to all my enemies, and even to my neighbors, a dismay to those of my acquaintance. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. I am forgotten like a dead man out of mind. I am as useless as a broken pot. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd. Fear is all around. They put their heads together against me. They plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, You are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant, and in your loving kindness save me. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Our second reading is from the book of Philippians chapter 2, beginning at the fifth verse. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh. 
Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door out in the open street, and they untied it. And those who stood there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their garments on it, and he sat upon it. And many spread their garments on the road, and others spread leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts, whereby you have given us life and immortality through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we enter this Palm Sunday, uh, every year for all the years that I've been doing Holy Week services, Palm Sunday, all the way through Easter Sunday, I've often wondered how does one talk about a story that basically speaks for itself? How do we talk about uh, an event in the world that changed the entire world, of which at this point in time over 65% plus of the Earth's population uh, claim to be Christian, to be followers of Jesus? At the end of this service today, I'm going to close with the abbreviated reading of the Passion. And when the Passion reading is finished, I'm not going to say anything except to put up my hand like this to let you know that we enter into the week of silence, the inter we enter into the week of pain and suffering, and we also enter into the week of redemption and grace. And then I will see all of you on Easter Sunday morning uh, at the town hall in Cambridge. When I think of Palm Sunday, I've had the pleasure, as some of you have had in the uh, parish, to walk down that Palm Sunday road. And I happened to luck out the time that I did it the first time because there was nobody on the road in front of me. So I was able to take photographs of an empty road going all the way down from the Mount of Olives to where Jesus entered into Jerusalem into the gate, which of course is now bricked up and has been for many, many, many years. And it's taught that when the Messiah returns, that that gate, the golden gate, will be blown open. It is through that gate that Jesus will, in fact, and the Messiah return again. The gate is still bricked up, and it has still been waiting to see the coming of the Messiah. My guess is when Jesus came into the city, there was great adulation and blessings and glory because they truly believed that the Messiah had come. But in their minds, the Messiah would have vanquished the Romans, would have restored Israel to its former powers, and the whole life and world would have been changed. People who were hungry would have been fed. People who had no place to live would have been housed. 
People who had very few clothing would be clothed. People who were sick would be tended to. And none of these things happened in the way that the bulk of the population and those who lined at Palm Sunday Road believed would happen. Because Jesus dies on the cross in great humility and not in great triumph as the kings and queens of the ancient world used to do. In Thebes in Egypt, uh, when I visited there, there was a long, there's a long corridor that goes into the city of Thebes. And um, whenever a king or pharaoh would be returning uh, and the battle had been won, trumpets would be blaring from the top of the uh, parapets and the columns, and music would be played, and there would be great adoration of the conquering hero to come in. We have a small portion of that going on in Jesus' walk on riding on the donkey into Jerusalem on that day. But it will be the last time that Jesus, in fact, is there and enters with that kind of adoration. People, as you know, very quickly turned and began to yell, crucify him, when what they believed was going to happen did, in fact, not happen. And what is interesting to me, when you watch the um, people and how they respond, it's not much different than what we see in our own culture today. We see things fall apart when a leader disappears. Uh, we see societies come apart when those elected officials disappear. We see societies get at each other's throat when there's no apparent leader in the midst of them. The whole world experiences these kinds of episodes every day in some manner or another. But what I think is so powerful about this Palm Sunday is a phrase taken from the prophet Isaiah, and it reads like this. I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. He who vindicates me is near, I think, is crucial for the Christian life. Because the Christian life, we strive to get to a place which Scripture defines as heaven. Now, whether we go to a place which has golden streets and you know, jeweled walls and so forth, I cannot say that that is where we're going to go. But these are the things that we use to describe a place which must be better than where we find ourselves currently now. I've often believed that a person who was terminally ill or in tremendous pain or distress on those last days, that when God finally took that person from us, that that person was in fact in heaven because they were no longer suffering in this world in which we live. We see people senselessly killed like the 18 this past week, the two shootings in the last seven, eight days, of which we will be praying for those folks by name in the prayers of the people today. Just going about their normal everyday business, and because someone has a grievance or an ideological difference, then that gives them permission to do whatever they choose. And this is the antithesis of what God chooses and wants for his world. This is why I believe that Christ hung in humility, took the taunting and the suffering, so that you and I would understand out of these kinds of situations that we find ourselves in, we will be vindicated. We will be raised up. We will be lifted on that last day to be at the right-hand side of God. We use all kinds of words and phrases and pictures and and remembrances to really think about what heaven is supposed to be. But I do believe that there are glimpses of heaven in the world that we live in right now. And those glimpses of heaven exist in everybody's heart somewhere if they will only allow their heart to access that living soul and salvation and love that God has planted in each human heart. Now, we can talk about this all day, and I'm not talking about people who have medical or mental illnesses where this might become uh, jaded or tainted or changed. I'm not referring to those particular special situations. But I'm referring to people in general that Jesus came to save. All of those people who threw palms and branches and garments on the road, what did they think at the crucifixion? Did they run away? Did they hide? What did they do? Did they continue to pray? We even know that the disciples were scattered and that Peter went and he cries when Jesus is betrayed and he denies him three times. 
He cries, but in the end, at the great resurrection, he is vindicated. He is brought back to a loving God who loves his creation, literally no matter how bad we choose to be, God will vindicate us if we believe in that heaven which resides in our heart. As we go through this Palm Sunday week, this holy week, think of it as holy because our souls are like flint and we will be vindicated. We will be vindicated because a God who loved the world so much that he allowed his son to be humiliated. As it said in last week's lessons, I will glorify you and I will glorify you again. And this is what will happen on Easter. And when Jesus is glorified, we too are going to be glorified if we keep the faith, stay the course, and remember the commandments that God gave us in how to adore him and love him first and love our neighbor as ourself. On these two commandments, as it says, hang all of the law and the prophets. Amen. Let us continue with our Nicene Creed, which is page 358 in your prayer book, if you happen to have it. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We're continuing in this Lenten season on Palm Sunday with Prayers of the People, Form 1. That's page 383 if you have your prayer books. And the acclamation is, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For Joe, our president, Ralph, our governor, Ken, our mayor, for the leaders of all the nations and for everyone in authority, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For our town of Kenbridge and for every city and community and for those who live in them, especially remembering our first responders, our caregivers, doctors, nurses, all medical practitioners and our teachers and students, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For those who travel on land, on water, or in the air, or through outer space, especially praying for those on the International Space Station. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, for Dot, Ryan, Bob, Margaret, Billy, Tom, Lori, Buddy, Buck, Tommy, Joe, Lee, 
John, Jim, and Kathy, and all those infected with COVID-19, and for all the sick and suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the healing of the divisions in our country and every country who is struggling with anxiety, unrest, hatred, and violence, let us pray to the Lord. For all branches of our armed forces and their members, especially we offer prayers for Josh, Roger, Aaron, and Joe, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those celebrating their birthdays this week, for Raymond Amos and Greta Stewart, and for all those celebrating anniversaries everywhere, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for those with addictions, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, praying especially for Soon Chung Park, Hyung Jung Grant, Soon Chu Kim, Yong Ai Yu, Delaney Ashley Wan, Paul Andre Michaels, Zhao Ji Tan, Dao Yung Fing, Officer Eric Talley, Denny Strong, Nevin Stanisic, Ricky Oles, Trelone Burkowski, Suzanne Fountain, Terry Laker, Kevin Mahoney, Lynn Murray, and Jody Waters. And for those who continue to die from COVID-19, and for all of those who have died suddenly by violence and unprepared everywhere in the world, and all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Deliver us, defend us, and in thy compassion protect us, Lord, by thy grace. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, St. Paul, St. Andrew, and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To thee, O Lord, our God. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us continue with the words our Savior Christ himself has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds and the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this week and forevermore. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Yeah.
As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused Jesus of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, any one for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then Pilate answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish me to do with the man that you call the king of the Jews? The crowd shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked him why, what evil has he done? Crucify him. But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led Jesus into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed Jesus in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. The soldiers compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry Jesus' cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then the soldiers brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And the soldiers crucified Jesus and divided his clothes among them casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified Jesus. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with Jesus they crucified two bandits, one on the right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, 
save yourself, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking Jesus among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with Jesus also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to Jesus to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw in this way Jesus breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow Jesus and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if Jesus were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked whether Jesus had been dead for some time. When Pilate learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Joseph then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where the body had been laid. <laughs> 